I'm gonna be recording the, the meeting because there are a few faculty that asked to for us to record this presentation. So today, Fernando and I, we want to pre present to everyone else our textbook. This is an OER textbook for intermediate Spanish for education professionals. We have been working on this textbook for the last two and a half year, three years. Well, so, yeah. two and a half years. Time flies, huh? Before that, we have Mariah here. She will talk a little bit about OER. It's okay. thanks to her that we decided to write this textbook and the program she started. Do you want me to come in front of the camera? Or just just come a little here? closer to the microphone. Okay. Sure. Just so we know that the people watching the recording catch you as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, know. the chat is disabled. The chat is disabled. Oh. shouldn't be. Don't worry about it, Marta. I will send an email to everyone. Okay. Well, um, welcome everybody to this to the celebration. My name is Mariah Burnett, and I am the scholarly communications librarian for the university. And so a big part of what I do for my job is to support the Open Hawks program, which is which is um, a grant program that provides faculty and graduate students with both financial and other types of support to really get OER projects off the ground. So for those of you who don't know what OER is, and I'm assuming probably a lot of you do, but, but if you don't, um, OER is, it stands for Open Educational Resources. And these are teaching, learning, and research resources that are free of cost for students and free of access barriers, so they don't have to sign in to any sort of system or log on with any credentials. And they're also openly licensed for reuse. So that's kind of a key component, right? So a lot of times people will use and reuse things online, but they're just sort of pirated versions of copyrighted content. That's not what this is at all. So these are um, <clears throat> resources that are intentionally licensed for reuse by other faculty. And I'm very pleased and excited for the release of Salon de Classe because I think this book has been very highly anticipated, both among Spanish faculty at our university, but also at other institutions and other folks sort of in various OER circles that I've talked to. Um, and I think it really is sort of a prime example of OER. Um, so one of the things that that OER can do is save students money, obviously, right? So these are free from day one. And the average student spends more than $1,400 a year on textbooks, which might seem, you know, like compared to tuition and room and board, that's a drop in the bucket, but really it's all just part of kind of a mounting educational cost that students are increasingly ill-prepared to shoulder, right? And so um, as faculty members, you guys do have the ability to control the resources that you use in class. And so by choosing OER, you really are, you know, ensuring that your students aren't having to buy expensive textbooks and they'll have their materials on the first day of class. The other thing that's really great about OER is that unlike commercial textbooks, it can be modified. So if you find a book that you think, you know, it's pretty good, maybe 80% of it's great, maybe 25%, 20% of it needs a, a bit of a refresh, you can do that. You can do that legally and you can do that um, collaboratively or on your own. And it really, you know, can improve the quality of the resources as well. So I won't spend too much time talking about <laughs> Giovanni and Fernando's project since they'll be talking about that themselves. But I would just um, say, you know, if you were interested, if you like see this work and are inspired to kind of do something similar, I would suggest that you start small, kind of see what's out there. You know, um, there are a lot of OER that exist and they're, they're found in various collections and repositories. So I would suggest starting by just kind of reviewing what's out there, seeking out out some examples and seeing how they align with your course. Um, you might want to also start small by just integrating kind of small bits of OER into your course, um, you know, using openly licensed videos and simulations and PowerPoints and things like that, rather than jumping right into developing a textbook. But, you know, if you are at the point where you'd like to develop a textbook or some other kind of OER, learning resource. Um, there are a lot of supports for that here at the university. Um, they're somewhat distributed, but, but they are in place. Um, the Office of Teaching, Learning and Technology is particularly excellent for helping with kind of integrating OER into an existing course, helping with, um, with a course overhaul. Librarians can also help you find source material. And then there's the Open Hawks program, which I kind of um, administer, I guess. 
And we just received word that we're actually going to be funded for another three years from the provost, which is very exciting. We've been waiting for that for a while. And so um, we'll be opening up our next round of funding uh, next spring. So probably in April will be the deadline for the call for proposals. But we should be announcing that very shortly in the new year. So look for that. And finally, I'd just like to conclude by giving a big congratulations and a big thank you to Giovanni and Fernando. Um, this book and the others coming out of the Spanish program as well are really, I think, perfect exemplars of what can be done with a little money, a robust community of collaborators, and ambition to provide students with excellent free textbooks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Fernando. Okay, so I guess we're gonna introduce ourselves. Uh, I think, you know, pretty much all the audience know us, but like, you know, my name is Fernando. Uh, I'm a lecturer of Spanish at Binghamton University, State University of New York. And uh, here I teach uh, courses of Spanish uh, at different levels of the curriculum, as well as Hispanic culture and Hispanic linguistics. Uh, I don't know, you might wanna talk a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm Giovanni Zimotti. I'm the director of the Spanish language program here at the University of Iowa, and we've been working on this. So that's it. Quick introduction. <laughs> yeah, so we wanted to start our presentation talking a little bit about, like, you know, why Salon de Classe is like, you know, uh, it's that has been created, and uh, the um, like the beginning of the of this journey was like, you know, some conversations that uh, Giovanni and I had based on certain needs that you could identify uh, in the GP program at Iowa. Uh, we had some uh, courses, specifically one course focused on Spanish for health professionals. And like, you know, the development of courses of Spanish for specific purposes is something that like, you know, uh, has been popular for a little while, although most of those courses are or were either very introductory or uh, higher level courses. So we thought that uh, having courses of uh, Spanish for specific purposes at the intermediate two level, which at Iowa is the last course, is a fourth semester course of Spanish, that is the last course uh, of the uh, requirement, a language for language requirement at Iowa, uh, we thought that it could be a good uh, way to make students maybe interested in continuing their studies of Spanish uh, at the university, uh, maybe you know, uh, uh, get into a minor or a major, a major in Spanish, and like you know, based on my previous experience, like before being at the University of Iowa, I taught at the West Liberty uh, School District, and I thought it would be a good idea to try to give a voice to, you know, Spanish the language in general and Spanish speakers in particular in the US education system. So I started to like, you know, look for uh, resources, uh, textbooks to maybe use in a, uh, in a course like that. And uh, I realized that like, you know, textbooks about Spanish and education were really uh, in general expensive for what they could offer. Some of them were outdated from the uh, pedagogical perspective. Uh, some of them were really, really basic and uh, like, you know, people couldn't develop uh, a proficiency that was like, you know, uh, higher than elementary Spanish, I guess, or were too advanced. And some of them were really, really specific and were really, uh, I don't know, like terminology handbooks, things like that, but really didn't help in developing grammar structures and, uh, and other type of uh, skills. So without that, you know, if we create such a course uh, focus on uh, um, students who may be interested in working in a school setting at some point, uh, maybe not just as uh, teachers, but, you know, as administrators or as counselors or as psychologists or social workers. So we thought about it in a broad term and um, we thought like, you know, if what it is available already doesn't really meet our expectations or our needs, maybe we can try to create something on our own. And, uh, you know, as Mariah said, like, you know, uh, instead of uh, trying to start small, we like, you know, we engage in trying to create a whole textbook. 
it's been a, a challenge, but, uh, but you know, that's how we arrived to the conclusion that an OER could be a good option for, for us. So why did we decide to create an OER? Uh, an OER allowed us to uh, tailor the content of the textbook to the needs of what we call the 21st world century students right now. Uh, the idea of uh, using a creative and collaborative, and collaborative approach to learning, uh, that way students can learn certain skills and abilities that they may be able to apply to the, uh, their professional future. And of course, that to encourage critical thinking, uh, discussing certain important uh, topics. Then uh, the fact of using an, an OER allowed us to easily adapt uh, depending on the needs of the instructor and of course the needs of the, of the student. And we're gonna talk a little bit about like, you know, what type of course can be taught with this resource. Uh, it would also allow us to uh, integrate multimedia and other interactive materials. You know, some of the textbooks that I explored at the beginning had like, this CD-ROM with audio files, like, you know, uh, my computer doesn't even have a CD-ROM CD uh, reader anymore, and I guess yours neither. So, uh, you know, we decided that, you know, multimedia that could be played uh, online could be also something that we could have in our OER. And, you know, I already mentioned the savings for students, and I think both the University of Iowa, Binghamton University, and other institutions are pushing very hard now and try to implement this kind of resources that can provide uh, free access to uh, quality materials for our students. Uh, so, you know, before talking a little bit more about the features of the, of the textbook, we wanted to first thank everyone that has made possible the development of this, uh, of this textbook. Uh, we have like a lot of people to thank. We have what we call Nuestras Estrellas, our stars, uh, you know, stakeholders in the field of education that allowed us to use authentic materials in our uh, modules. Uh, we also have uh, certain institutions within the University of Iowa that provided, for example, funding, uh, Mariah and the Open Hacks, uh, Open Hacks Grant, thank you to them. Uh, the Learning Design Collaboratory from the Office of Teaching, Learning and Technology for they provided us assistance in uh, the early stages of developing the course that was the base of this textbook. Uh, the studio uh, at the Distance and Online Education Department at Iowa that provided like, you know, the means for uh, recording the, uh, the videos that we later used. And of course, the CLCL at Iowa or Language Media Center, as I used to know, uh, like, you know, uh, among other things, organize this presentation. So thank you guys for all your help. Then we had some collaborators developing some, you know, activities, uh, grammar videos that have been integrated in the textbook, uh, captions for, for videos. Some of them are in here. We thank all of them. Uh, and of course, we have uh, like, you know, a pool of reviewers uh, and that we divided in a couple of uh, slides in here because there are a lot of them. We had reviewers from 10 higher education institutions that provided a lot of insight for us to improve our textbook. The textbook was piloted for a couple of semesters at Iowa and based on uh, feedback from uh, students and, and the reviewers and, and, and everything, uh, we tried to uh, improve it to the way it is uh, right now. Okay, I'm um, going to talk a little bit about guiding principles. I will talk a little bit about the guiding principles. So when we started working on the textbook, we decided we started thinking about in collaboration with the Center for Teaching. We started looking at the teaching objective and what type of principles where was our textbook starting, what we wanted to follow, and first of all about the content design. So we decided to have a back, and those are like our Estrellas. Those are the <laughs> people around Iowa that we interviewed for the textbook to include authentic material. So we, we did a backward design. So we first started designing and creating the learning objectives for our classroom. We had two different sets of learning objectives. We had learning objectives on our grammar or language side and learning objectives that we thought a future educator should know or they would need to be a successful educator. And then we, uh, combined with that, we did the video interviews of those seven Spanish speakers, 
and we also send a survey to i think like 15 16 uh, educators around the country to ask them what type of learning objectives what do you think it will be useful for a future educator a future administrator when they are teaching in five years in six years uh, the second part uh, we really wanted a student-centered classroom we believe that students should be in the middle of learning they should be involved in the whole process of learning so because of that we decided to have some authentic resources so that they could see like real people speaking the language uh, thematic model you will see later all our module have a specific team for example immigrant uh, immigrants in the us because it's the kind of like type of population that our students will interact in the future uh, we also used a lot of communicative activities so that we don't actually have to teach the student we just have to help them learn and we had a lot of focus on meaning and learning by doing so that our students can use the language as much as possible during our classrooms uh, we also decided to include some task-based projects to do some formative assessment instead of just using exams and most like uh, summative assessment we wanted our students to keep learning during while they're learning while they're completing each lesson uh, we also included some guided discussion some real world tasks and we included 20, 226 h5p self-assessed self-assessed interactive activities so those are activities that the students can complete in class or they can complete on their own as homework and they can get the results of what they're doing to know if they're doing the stuff correctly or not uh, we also wanted to include some grammar teaching because we understand that it's important to learn grammar in a language classroom especially at this level like it's still a fourth semester spanish uh some of our principle for teaching grammar is to introduce one thing at a time do not present too much grammar all together or the students will get confused and distracted uh still again a lot of communicative communicative activities it's very important for us that grammar is presented organically inside the various activities and not separate and we also wanted to include some because we know that sometimes students are struggling with grammar and they really feel like oh i need more grammar i need more grammar explanation but we don't want to dedicate the whole classroom time to grammar explanation so we included 21 videos in english with caption in english explaining the grammar so that if there are students that are having trouble understanding or they're they need that extra help they can go home watch the video and come back to class more prepared for the communicative activities we also kept in mind adaptability and accessibility for everyone and for this first of all we designed this class or this textbook for a hybrid course meaning some face-to-face -face instructions some instructions online but given the flexibility of the platform and the oer it can be easily adapted to a more traditional setting if someone wants to use this textbook they can also grab it and change it change the order based on what they're teaching so that's why it's good to have OER. We designed this class as a four semester course, meaning we're thinking about the students should have an intermediate mid, intermediate low level for the actual. But given the content, this student, this textbook could be used on an accelerated intermediate class. It can also be used, it could also be used on a third year upper level course because there are some grammar topics that are introduced for the first time, like the subjunctive. It's introduced for the first time in a fourth semester course, but the students will not learn all of the content, all of these grammars in a fourth semester course. They will need some review. They will need some strengthening of their abilities. So it can be used at a third year upper level course for sure. Also, this, the content can be customized based on your needs as an instructor or on your students' needs. So if you notice that something is doesn't fit your school, so for example, we have a a lesson about the school in West Liberty that is a dual language school 50 minutes away from Iowa City but maybe let's say you are teaching in California and there is another school that does a similar thing you could adapt the content change the picture change the topics and make it work for your own region your own country and then all videos include captions to make it more accessible we had people from the CLC working on this so we appreciate it and this Center for Teaching also worked on those captions, so it's 
pretty nice having all those videos and saved us a lot of time. Fernando, I will let you talk about the features and content. All right, so talking about the content of the, uh, of the textbook, first we decided to divide or organize the textbook in four uh, modules, uh, thematic modules, but that were based on uh, one specific topic. Uh, so if you move forward, Giovanni, uh, we can see the uh, content organization uh, divided in the, those four modules. So module number one is focused on immigrant students in K-12 education. So the idea for this first module was to uh, include uh, immigrant voices and the experience of these immigrant kids or uh, children of immigrants who arrived to, to the US who may or may not be uh, American themselves and discuss certain concepts that may be related to those experiences. We talk, for example, about the concept of a soñador, a dreamer, uh, we talk about DACA, we talk about certain uh, organizations that uh, act as advocates of this uh, population. Uh, for example, uh, the organization Aliento comes to mind from Arizona, uh, and we include um, activities related to, to those organizations, and we explore uh, what they do, uh, and so on. Then we talk a little bit about borders between countries and the evolution, for example, of arrivals of immigrants to the United States uh, and how that shapes the uh, student population in our schools. Then in module number two, uh, we explore the topic of bilingual education in the United States. Uh, we introduce the concept of bilingual education that for some people may not be uh, very clear. Uh, and we talk about types of bilingual education uh, we actually feature, as uh, uh, Giovanni mentioned, one school district in Iowa, the West Liberty School District. That is the actual district where I uh, used to work before uh, getting to, to Iowa. And we discuss certain initiatives that have been introduced in the last few years, like the seal of biliteracy to acknowledge the proficiency in both languages, Spanish and English, uh, uh, for a lot of uh, our students when they finish uh, high school. And we discuss certain challenges and certain opportunities of bilingual education in our uh, school system. Uh, then module number three is focused on the educational system of some Spanish speaking countries. So we try to focus on the expertise of our stars uh, to talk about different features of education systems in countries like Spain, Venezuela, Mexico, Uruguay, and even uh, based on their experience, the uh, um, uh, like the uh, educational system here in the United States and maybe try to pose certain comparisons, maybe differences that may be important for an educator to, to know as they encounter this type of uh, student population, okay? And differences in terms of uh, stages of education, in terms of uh, the cost of education for students, uh, the role of sports, for example, and even like, you know, talking a little bit about past and what we can uh, um, expect in the future of education. And then lastly, in module number four, we decided to call it the school ecosystem. And uh, here we wanted to give a voice to uh, like, you know, other stakeholders. Like when we think about education, obviously the teacher is the first person we, uh, we have in mind, but like, you know, the idea of how teachers uh, work together with administrators, with counselors, with nurses, uh, and here we wanted to talk about uh, certain things that um, these educators are gonna face in, um, in a school district, like uh, physical and mental health, for example, the concept of bullying, uh, what nurses do, uh, I don't know, the use of inclusive language in, in Spanish, uh, LGBT, LGBTQ rights, uh, the role of parents, which are obviously very, very important in a school and so on and so forth. Then within each module, this is like the general division of uh, the thematic content, but then within each module, we're going to have uh, several parts. The first uh, of them is what we call portada. Uh, portada, which is pretty much like the front page, almost like in a, in a newspaper, is kind of like the introduction for the topic of the course. Uh, as you can see on the bottom left, like we introduce certain uh, learning objectives, both from the linguistic and the cultural and professional perspective. 
and we introduced some basic discussion questions to introduce the topic, and we tried it to we try to use the a very visual type of activities with graphs, with statistics, with infographics to try to start the discussion about the topic. Then the next section was the project. So uh, Giovanni talked about you know formative assessment, uh, and we decided to include this task-based type of projects. Uh, and the idea was that the completion of this project would take several weeks. And like, you know, uh, during the time that we were working with one specific module, students could, you know, uh, along their learning of the different, you know, vocab and, and grammar topics and so on, uh, they could start preparing uh, these projects that in the end would try to uh, produce some type of uh, artifact, okay? And they would try to develop the three modes of communication, interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational, both from the oral perspective and the written perspective, okay? And, you know, for some of them, they have to produce a CV, for some of them, they have to produce the, some type of presentation, and so on and so forth. Then the next part is Nuestras Estrellas. We've talked about them, so we have like this uh, interviews with uh, stakeholders in the field of education, uh, people who are of Hispanic Latino background. Uh, here in the uh, top right image, we see Vicente, one of our stars, uh, doing that interview in, in the studio. And they allowed, they allowed us to use authentic material in the classroom, uh, some content related to the topic of the module, and we try to integrate both cult vocabulary and cultural aspects and, you know, we try to uh, make them use examples of the grammar that students needed to uh, study for the chapter uh, used in context. I don't know if you, Giovanni, want to play a little bit this video from Diego. Sí, en, en, en la escuela West Library, le voy a hablar de West Library primordialmente, uh, tenemos un programa de educación dual, un programa que está bajo el área de la transición bilingüe en todos los Estados Unidos, así se le llama. Pero este programa dual es un programa que se le dice que es 50-50, o se le llama 50-50. Uh, y en la investigación hay diferentes modelos, pero tiene su modelo 50-50, que es básicamente 50% del tiempo se le enseña a los estudiantes en un lenguaje. Ok, thank you, Giovanni. So we have included one or two Nuestras Estrellas sections per module. Uh, they are designed to take approximately one 60-minute class period. Uh, it can be started, for example, the day of the portada, depending on the, on the module. And the idea is to bring not only, like, you know, some content uh, through, uh, through these stakeholders, but also a little bit of culture. So from, from uh, our stars, like, you know, we try to bring some cultural elements. Uh, Diego in, in, in his uh, interview, for example, talks about Cesar Chavez as one of the people who inspired him in the field of education. So we try to integrate some uh, culture uh, and we talk a little bit about Cesar Chavez and what he represented in the United States and so on and so forth. So the next section would be the lessons. So we divided uh, uh, for each module uh, the content in three different lessons. The number of activities per lesson vary, but they are uh, between 12 and 16 activities. Uh, these lessons are supposed to cover approximately two to three 60 minute class period, depending on the, uh, on the lesson. And what we tried was to include a, di a, li a little of a lot of different type of activities. Uh, we used, for example, extracts from the videos from our stars, like the uh, interviews that we did were really, really long. So we decided to uh, like, you know, divide them in little chunks of, of videos. And then uh, we developed some videos and our collaborators uh, helped in, in, in developing them. Uh, we also found some open source videos that we included in our activities. And we also use some authentic artifacts. We use some infographics that we created, some reading stories. We included certain uh, interviews that were important for, uh, for the lesson. 
Uh, and of course, we integrated the grammar and the vocab in communicative activities. Um, for example, we developed some role play situations where the students can uh, apply where they learn. And as Giovanni mentioned, the idea is that they notice the grammar structure first, and then they develop uh, their skills and try to use them in a semi-realistic uh, uh, way. Uh, then uh, Giovanni also mentioned interactive activities. So the use of H5P allowed us to make some self-check practice with automatic feedback. Some of these activities are multi-item and some of them are individual. So the ones that are individual have more specific uh, feedback that students can read to see if they are doing well or not. And uh, I think this is like a, a very interesting way for them to either use them in class or uh, being used as uh, homework. And I think like, you know, receiving that feedback uh, allows us to like, you know, make students know how they are doing as they are preparing for, uh, for class. Then the next section will be the guided discussion, which is pretty much like the culmination of each module. And the idea is to uh, introduce the uh, guided discussion with some uh, introductory vocabulary activities uh, before students have to read a longer reading uh, that is designed to prompt a discussion. And uh, the discussion can happen in class, like depending on the approach of the class, uh, but it can also uh, happen in a discussion forum, it could happen uh, as video presentations, and you know, uh, there's some adaptability and the instructor could use depending on their, uh, uh, what they want for their class in an, uh, one way or the other, okay? But here we are gonna uh, see some activities in which students are gonna have to identify main ideas in the text. Uh, they're going to have to develop certain artifacts like graphics or infographics, uh, develop a presentation uh, with their partners in class, uh, etc. And then the last sections of the of the modules would be the vocab and grammar overview. Giovanni? Yes. It's, yeah. Uh... Okay. So uh, uh, this include content specific vocabulary and some explicit grammar video explanations. They're, these are in English, so students can actually watch them at home if the class is following. Uh, uh, a flipped course uh, type of approach. And uh, they include some short self-check activities. And like, you know, here we have a, uh, a video of Megan talking about the present perfect subjunctive. And at some points of the video, Megan is gonna ask student to pause their video to complete some type of activity. And then they can see the correct answers and see if they did it right or not. El presente perfecto da su puntivo. Cuando usamos a presente perfecto del subjuntivo. As you learned before, moods in Spanish are made up of very. So that was just a quick little like five seconds of the video from Megan. And, and this is like, you know, the content of the uh, of the four modules in a nutshell. OK, so there is a lot to talk about them, I guess, but we have limited time. We don't want to bore you or take too much long of your time. So this was basically like the whole introduction for our textbook. Now, being OER, this is what can happen. We moving forward, we can have a lot of happening just with the textbook because it belongs to everyone. It doesn't belong strictly to us or to a publisher. So coming soon, strictly for our textbook, uh, we're working on a printing version available that will be non-profit for us, but it would cost like 10 or $9 per student. So that's kind of like, if a student wants a paper, paper version, they will be able to buy it online. Uh, we're working on developing an additional ancillary materials for that they will be ready for fall 2022. So for the first implementation of the textbook at the first three times that we taught this, this class, we use a combination of quizzes created on Canvas to practice grammar. And we also created a classroom on Duolingo where the students could for the practice what they were learning in the classroom. Starting next semester, we will keep developing more quizzes to have like more bigger quizzes that the students can do in like three hours, four hours per week. Uh, also, we're running a OER comparison study. We're gonna be comparing 
the usage of this textbook, well, an adaptation of this textbook with two other sections using a more traditional textbook to see how it compares, what the student engagement between the two and if they like it more or not, so if it's successful or not, basically. And also there is gonna be some slight update on content. Uh, for example, yesterday, by looking at uh, the last reviewers, we noticed that the, tw the some data from the census rose from 2010 because we were writing the textbook right before the new census came out. So we're gonna work on updating those little details and being OER, oh, yeah, it's super easy to do. We don't have to do go through a long process for that. And another amazing thing about OER is that we can adapt this textbook. So there is a need for an intermediate Spanish for healthcare professional textbook because the two most popular textbooks that existed up until two semesters ago, they stopped being supported by the publisher. So the online platform stopped working and we got we were teaching those classes and we were like, okay, now we cannot teach anymore. So we started developing with Alexis that is here, an adaptation of the textbook focused on healthcare. Uh, I'm currently working with other professors and teachers from around the country to adapt some of those lessons so that the textbook can be a more generic textbook and we could potentially use it for all sections of a four semester Spanish here at the University of Iowa. So those are like two adaptations coming soon. If you're watching this presentation and you're interested in doing a different one, you can, you just grab it, you ask for us, we can give you the link to download it and you can change it the way you want. And this is just the last two things. Uh, access to the textbook. This is the official website is on Pressbook. Pressbook is a platform of specifically designed to publishing textbook. Uh, if you have created a website in the past, it's very similar to WordPress. It's actually based on WordPress. It works pretty well. It's super easy to use. So if you want to try creating a new textbook or just some content, go and explore it. But this is the link to download our textbook. And this is the link for the official website of our textbook. If you were in real life, you got a QR code that you can scan with your phone and access the textbook. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. We really appreciate your time on a Friday afternoon. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, Fernando and I are here, and we will more than happy to answer. Yeah, we will be happy to answer any questions. And one thing that we actually didn't mention is that, I mean, we mentioned it is a free OER, but we have used a Creative Commons license. So it's a 4.0 Creative Commons license. So you know anyone could potentially uh, just, you know, giving some uh, attribution to ourselves as uh, the creators and not using it for profit. Uh, anyone can actually use any content that we have developed for their own needs.